Hey guys, Sun here. I'm a privacy and a security researcher and you're watching The Privacy Guides. Today is episode three of the Bitcoin series. I will be talking about security in the context of Bitcoin, so both InfoSec and OpSec, and why you would choose to install a wallet on your computer, smartphone, or use a hardware wallet, or a combination of all of these things, including running Electrum on Tails. Um, so as always, whatever you read down there in the comments, that might be someone trying to steal your money or steal your crypto. Please be mindful of this. And I am counting on everyone watching this part of the Privacy Guys community to report any spammy comments so that we can keep that conversation going. So my goal in today's episode is share my thought process when I was evaluating how I would set up the Bitcoin holding for the donations. Um, I wanted to make sure that the holding was safe and I kind of wanted to set it up as a case study. So I really thought about and explored all kinds of different scenarios from installing Electrum on my Mac to in uh, installing Electrum on Tails to using one or many hardware wallets. And I kind of want to talk about all of this. Um, now, first things first, I want to send a huge shout out to ShakePay. ShakePay has supported the privacy guides and has uh, sponsored this whole Bitcoin series. ShakePay is a Canadian exchange that allows Canadians to buy and sell Bitcoin. Uh, so yeah, if you don't know about them, I'll link to them in the description. Check them out. Okay, so um, the really interesting part of Bitcoin for someone like me, who's a privacy and a security researcher, is a lot of what I've explored over the past few years applies directly in the context of Bitcoin. So I'm a late bloomer in the context of Bitcoin. I wish I had bought Bitcoin way back in the day, uh, but I didn't, damn it. So uh, all that said, now Bitcoins are pretty expensive. So storing Bitcoin, especially if one is bullish that the price will go up over time, well, it's something that one has to be very mindful about. Now, if there's one thing I know about computers is they are inherently unsafe. If you've been watching the privacy guides for some time, you know that I'm a huge fan of compartmentalization. Uh, just saying that word is a mouthful, try it. Uh, compartmentalization is everything. So running, for instance, all of your apps on your desktop computer and installing an app such as Electrum, which I love, by the way, uh, well, that exposes Electrum to all of this other stuff. So if one of those apps has compromised your computer, so for instance, you know, an app that might be able to copy anything that you uh, store in the clipboard, or maybe that app has a key logger, or maybe that app is capable of exfiltrating files away from your computer. Well, what that means is that Electrum setup, Electrum will hold your private keys. If you haven't watched the first episodes of the series, I would highly recommend watching them in order, by the way, but Bitcoin is essentially a private key and a public key. And having that private key proves ownership of the public key. And that is how we get to move, you know, those Bitcoin on the blockchain. So what is a private key? Well, a private key is really a string of characters or a file. It's something that is very easy to exfiltrate and it's something that tends to have a pattern within it. So for instance, Electrum wallets are stored in a path that is well known. That means that an attacker can quite easily script malware to go on your computer and exfiltrate those files. And if that you know, app or malware knows that you have a wallet, it can start key logging your keystrokes extract your passphrase and boom, your holding is gone. Uh, what does that mean? That means that if you're gonna be holding like $100 in Bitcoin and you're comfortable losing that $100, it's just you're experimenting, uh, that's totally fine. Uh, but if you're in the thousands or tens of thousands uh, and you're not comfortable losing that holding, well, I would highly recommend against installing any app on your computer uh, and just using that app. It's possible to install an app and use a hardware wallet such as a Trezor more on this in a moment. Now, a safer way of doing things is using an app on your phone. That being said, usually that is really shitty from a privacy perspective and it's much harder to back up. So I have never personally used an app on an iPhone or Android phone. But the reason why things are safer in the context of phones is the operating system is designed to compartmentalize things much more using something called sandboxing. That means that apps usually only have access to files within the sandbox of that app. That makes it much safer. And also most smartphones these days have a secure element in which 
uh, keys can likely be stored. I haven't explored this in full depth, so I don't wanna say anything here that might not be true, but my gut feeling is it's much safer on phones. That being said, phones are not as well integrated with hardware wallets, so again, that would be good for something that we like calling hot wallets. A hot wallet is a wallet that you tend to not leave a lot of money in it. It's a wallet that is used for transactional stuff, but like quick transactional stuff. It's a little bit like a checking account versus a saving account in your bank uh, account. Whoa, count, 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 count. Okay, um, so now moving along, if you guys are gonna be uh, you know, acquiring Bitcoin to the extent of you know, multiple thousands or tens of thousands, that's when it gets really interesting. That's when OPSEC and InfoSec really become center stage. Uh, clearly, if you're gonna be uh, storing tens of thousands of dollars worth of Bitcoin, you wanna make sure that you are not uh, vulnerable to you know, key logger attacks or different forms of malware exploits on computers. And that's where uh, there's a whole bunch of things that we're gonna be discussing about throughout the series, but I really like using hardware wallets I think if you're in the you know thousands or low low tens of thousands, uh, using a hardware wallet is good. Uh, the problem with hardware wallets uh, are that a uh, paper backups for them are not so good. That's where that really cool little Raspberry Pi project is really helpful. I'll be talking about that later in the series. Um, the other thing is uh, in the context of Trezor, which I like. Now, full disclosure, this is a good moment to talk about this. Trezor has sent a few devices so that I could use them to create this content. I've been using Trezor devices for a while, so I really love Trezor, you know, and that's being authentic here. But they have uh, donated a few devices, so wanted to put that out. Trezor uh, devices are really cool. They're open source. They do not use a secure element because secure elements are proprietary. Uh, that means that they are less secure but more transparent. That is something that Ledger uh, has been shoving up their uh for a while. Uh, Ledger is not as open source and uses proprietary secure elements, which perhaps, perhaps makes them more secure, but everyone involved in security tends to know that everything end up being broken. And that is where when you have a really healthy community in the open source world, uh, the community really helps each other out mitigate vulnerabilities and you know stay ahead of them that said in the context of trezors and that is where opsec is a huge deal here uh trezors model one uh, and trezors model t have a vulnerability uh, it is possible to exfiltrate the pin and the private key out of them uh, it's a pretty sophisticated attack it's not expensive from a hardware perspective uh, but it is possible. Now, if you guys are using a BIP39 passphrase, and that is the passphrase that you were perhaps asked to configure in the context of Trezor, you're good to the extent of how secure that passphrase is. So I always recommend using a passphrase when setting up a Trezor device. Not only does it solve that vulnerability, but it is also great for plausible deniability. So again, OPSEC operational security. What happens if someone can attack your setup in the physical world? What if someone can steal your Trezor device? Maybe that Trezor device is in a bank vault or at some of a friends of yours house, but what if that third party uh, becomes malicious? Uh, well, that is a problem. Now, uh, I will be talking about this in a second. There are ways of mitigating this using multi-signature, more on that. Uh, shortly. Uh, now, the Trezor Model T has a feature where uh, it has a little secure, uh, well, micro SD card uh, reader built into it, and it can store a specific piece of data on that SD card that will extend uh, the cryptographic signing process, I believe, on the device. I haven't read through that whole spec, but essentially it means that you need to have that SD card and the Trezor Model T device to be able to sign a transaction. So that makes it much safer in the context of having it in a bank vault. If you have the SD card at home, the SD card kind of acts uh, similarly to multi-signature. So holy moly, was that a lot of information. Is anyone still watching? Uh, okay, so why am I saying all this? Well, installing an app on your computer and storing the private keys on your computer, even if they're encrypted, 
If it's a computer that you're using for multiple things, that is not safe at all. So there are two options here. Either you use another computer that is single use, uh, and that is something that we will be doing later in the series using Tails OS, so you can use the same hardware if your computer is compatible, and boot into Tails. Tails is an amnesic operating system that means that it does not save to disk whatever you're doing on it, and it routes everything through Tor. So it's great for compartmentalization, security-wise, and for privacy. So I'm gonna be showing you guys how to do this. That said, the user experience of using Tails standalone is a little quirky, it's not so convenient. That is where using a Trezor device or any other hardware wallet, I have to look into cold card, by the way, that really shows promise, um, it allows you to have all the convenience of using your computer and Electrum, for instance, but then doing the cryptographic signing process on this. And this is actually an equivalent of a single-use computer. That means that even though it's connected through USB, for those who don't know hardware wallets, this doesn't show up as like a storage device. This is essentially using a very strict hardened protocol to sign transactions on the Trezor and then just send over the signed transaction to the computer. So even if the computer's uh, vulnerable, in theory, it cannot uh, alter that transaction, which has been approved on the screen here. So you can make sure, you know, in an air gap way that things are safe. Uh, that is where hardware wallets are amazing. And if you wanna go batshit crazy overkill, um, you can use Tails OS, which is great for security and privacy, and use a hardware wallet, which is what I personally do. And I actually bring that to a whole other extent by using something called Multisig. So in the context of Bitcoin, a feature that I love so much, uh, it's such a smart feature, Multisig. Multisig allows uh, us to set up wallets in a way where we need multiple private keys to sign transactions. Now, from a privacy perspective, we take a little hit right now. I think this is uh, this will be improved shortly as I think Schnorr, uh, maybe I'm messing that up, will be released. But essentially, multi-signature means that in order to sign a transaction, you need to have more than one signing entity. And what is a signing entity? Well, it could be a whole separate Electrum setup. So you could have Electrum running on Tails on two separate USB sticks. Uh, and you could co-sign a transaction using both different instances. Now that really sucks for convenience, and that is where hardware wallets are amazing. Uh, a setup that I will be showcasing later in the series is using Electrum on Tails and using one Trezor device uh, as the second signing entity and setting up a Shamir Secret two of three uh, recovery uh, key essentially, which can be geo dispersed and that setup is super robust. So besides being kidnapped and tortured, which I wish no one will ever be, uh, you're covered essentially, because the way it works is you have your Electrum wallet in the context of Tails, which has one signing key. Uh, you have a Trezor device, which has another signing key. And the third uh, mnemonic is stored using encrypted paper backups similar to this. And that is something that you guys can uh, geo disperse at friend's house or whatever. And that means that in order to compromise the setup, <clears throat> uh, you would, like an attacker would have to compromise, you know, you for the passphrases, the computer on which Tails is running or the USB stick, and then either go in a bank vault to access the other Trezor device or go to a bunch of your friend's house to get all of those little paper backups to then use the Raspberry Pi to restore the secret as you can imagine, this is becoming very complicated. And that is what OPSEC is all about. OPSEC is about putting in place systems of governance or security checkpoints where an attack becomes impractical or not financially interesting anymore or too risky, etc. So I hope this gives you guys context as to how to secure Bitcoin holdings and the level of security that may be required for all kinds of different sizes of holdings. If you have questions, drop them in the comments. I will be uh, maybe eventually throughout the series answering some of those questions at the end of episodes. Uh, so yeah, I'll see you soon in the next episode. Bye. Hey guys, uh, I do consulting. If you guys need help to set up a really robust Bitcoin holding uh, and you would like me to hold your hand, I can do that. 
so yeah, get in touch. I'll link to my contact page in the description. And by the way, thanks to everyone who has donated so far, this project is possible thanks to contributions of viewers like you. Uh, so all donations are put to work and allow me to do more of this, create more content. Uh, so yeah, thanks. Bye.